icons have become typical or, or normative in our Orthodox Christian life and practice. But it's important to note that this hasn't always been the case. Uh, in the early church, there was a tremendous controversy over the use of icons, uh, or even the possibility of icons. And of course, I'm referring to the, the period known as iconoclasm, where uh, during various phases, phases of the controversy, icons were banned, icons were destroyed, there were different saints and, and doctors writing in defense against them theologically, and ultimately it was settled by an ecumenical council. Uh, the history is actually much more convoluted than, than that, and we can't go too profoundly in you know a blow-by-blow -blow historical account. That would be a, a class in and of itself. But we're going to sketch broadly the iconoclastic controversy, both historically and theologically. Iconoclasm really begins with the, the decree of the Emperor Leo III in 730. So Emperor Leo declared that all icons uh, be removed from public places in the imperial capital. And at first, this didn't really affect images that were in the church, but in, in the civic spaces of the capital. Um, so famously, the icon on the, the Chalki Gate, which was the gate into the uh, palace complex, uh, was removed. And that was the central icon of, of, of Byzantine uh, civic life. And that caused tremendous controversy. It actually caused a riot. Uh, there's a famous story of uh, one of the soldiers who was on a ladder going to take down the icon and, and, and deface it. Uh, he was rushed by this group of pious ladies who toppled him from his ladder and he fell to his death. So it, it, it did cause a riot uh, when iconoclasm was first decreed. And often historians, even church historians, see the iconoclasm as almost out of the blue. It's just happening all of a sudden. It's very different than other theological controversies in the early church where uh, we see a buildup where we have different theological schools, or, or, or rival factions that eventually just blows up into something that needs an ecumenical council to settle. Iconoclasm is, is different than that. We don't see a large buildup of anti-icon sentiment or a theological school associated to iconoclasm. It appears um, just out of the blue and causes tremendous havoc to the life of the church. So, what were the causes of iconoclasm then? The most obvious example, what you'll often see uh, as the example or, or as the, the primary cause, is, of course, the rise of Islam. But the rise of Islam doesn't directly, um, directly lead to iconoclasm. The theology, if you could put it that way, of the iconoclasts are very different than the, the logic behind Islamic iconoclasm. Islamic iconoclasm has its own its own theories behind it where, you know, to depict something that's living is an affront to God, the creator. So Islamic art, you know, eventually it did have vegetal motifs, but it, it almost exclusively had geometric motifs. It didn't depict anything living. And that's not the logic of iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, uh, somewhat counterintuitively to, to express it this way, is a Christian heresy, uh, where Islam uh, is just incorrect. Uh, so iconoclasm begins, and it's somewhat of a mystery, but it is, it is due to this pressure of Islam. So we have to understand the historical context. You have the Roman Empire, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. At this point, the West has fallen to, to Gothic incursion, but you have the Eastern Roman Empire, and it stretches all the way from the Balkans into Syria, south into Egypt, uh, back west again, into North Africa. It's, it's a Mediterranean civilization. And within a generation, that huge swaths of that civilization are just lost and, and lost really not to be recovered again. Uh, Palestine falls. Egypt falls. Mesopotamia falls. And there's nothing the empire could do to really stop it. Um, and there's historical reasons for that. The empire had been fighting uh, for centuries, uh, but a hundred year war with the Persian empi empire. And finally, the Persians were defeated. Actually, uh, as, as the emperor, I believe it is Heraclius, was going back 
to Constantinople from defeating the Persians is when um, you know, uh, Muhammad had his his uh, revelation and Islam really really begins. So it's right at the point where the Roman Empire is completely exhausted that this new force um, sweeps over the war-torn uh, areas of, of Palestine and Mesopotamia and Syria and there, there's no there's nothing to stop them. The, the Persian Empire has been completely defeated. They can't, they can't stop Islamic incursion. And every time the Christians go to, to halt the progress of the Islamic armies, uh, they're defeated. So <clears throat> this leads to a lot of, uh, for lack of a better term, a soul searching amongst the imperial class, or particularly the emperor, of why is this happening? Why can't we win a battle? You know, the Emperor Heraclius, he was uh, not, we should say, a friend of the church. He, he has something of a bad reputation that we'll, we'll get into maybe later. Um, but he was known as a pious man. He's, he's the man who brought the, the cross that was captured by the Persians back to Jerusalem, even to Constantinople, and then permanently in Jerusalem. He was known to go out to battle with icons of the Theotokos. So icons and relics were part of how the Roman military functioned, how, how the, the empire functioned. And that was held into question. If you go out in a battle and you just defeated an ancient empire with all these relics and all these icons, why can't you defeat the, these Islamic armies. So there is a, a military ideological uh, foundation for why iconoclasm happens so suddenly uh, in the imperial circles. So that's one very significant, uh, very significant source of the iconoclasm. In our culture, we take for granted ideas like the separation of the church and the state and, and we tend to think that's a, an ideal situation, but throughout most of Christian history, the normative situation is a much more integral partnership between uh, the, the church and the state. Uh, classically, we, we know this as symphonia. They both have their own, you know, domains of competency, but they're not completely isolated or independent. They, they cooperate towards the establishment of a Christian society. Uh, so there was no separation of church and state in Byzantium and, and really throughout most of Christian history. So, uh, you know, we as moderns, particularly as Americans, need to just uh, recall that or check that, that our political situation may not be normative or ideal. Um, but one of the, you know, as good as that situation can be, it also does lead to tensions, does lead to problems. And usually the problems are the result of overreach of imperial power into the life of the church. Uh, the classic work on this is, is Father Meyendorf's, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, imperial Unity and Christian Division. And in that, uh, Father Meyendorf documents how, how the empire would interfere in the life of the church for the sake of political unity and often try to force Christian unity by compromise uh, theological formulations or or banning discussion of certain uh, theological ideas as a way to get the empire to to stay together and its Christian population to not fragment into to different um, into different sects and usually that imperial uh, force shattered the uh, shattered that unity they were trying to achieve so it, it usually didn't work and iconoclasm can be seen as one of these instances where where the the state is trying to interfere in the life of the church maybe with good intentions but it winds up doing a lot more damage than any kind of perceived good politically so there's there's two stories in symphonia there's one story that looks at the great accomplishments of constantine the great uh, of justinian of theodosius but there's another story of of constant interference by the emperors even sometimes uh, patriarchs losing their lives um in in defense of these 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 uh autonomous domains they're integrated but but the emperor is not uh, is not a cleric. He can't really get involved in in establishing doctrine, and that's what is involved in iconoclasm. Is the emperor is saying this practice, 
is not only banned, but it's also theologically erroneous. It's idolatrous. So Islam was a major exterior force or exterior pressure that was, was building up into iconoclasm. But it wasn't the only pressure. Uh, many historians, theologians, and liturgists have pointed out that just before the advent of iconoclasm, there was a major shift in Byzantine piety, a shift in how people in Constantinople were understanding liturgy. This shift can best uh, be attested to by the, the work of St. Germanus, uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, and his commentary on the Divine Liturgy. Um, and why this text is so significant is that Germanus is using classic biblical interpre interpretation techniques, but he's not using the standard Alexandrian technique um, of, of finding the spiritual sense. He's using, uh, instead, an Antiochian technique that, that really tries to root itself in the historical, literal sense, and then draws a fuller sense out of that, but never independent, never separated from it. So uh, both schools of interpretation have sort of a two-part process, but in the Alexandrian school, that, that first part, that historical sense, the, the whole realm of matter and history, is really just a jumping off point to a spiritual spiritual interpretation. And that's how fathers previous to Germanos have interpreted liturgy. I'm thinking of uh, Maximus the Confessor, and also, uh, you know, this goes all the way back to Dionysius the Areopagite and his, um, his celestial hierarchy, which is a, a commentary, in a sense, of the liturgical and, and hierarchical tradition. And that's, he does use that, that Alexandrian sort of True, uh, true level interpretation. So Germanos is doing something very different. He's doing something very Antiochian, and that leads to a focus now on the the historia. Uh, what is the church doing? What is the historical significance of the different rituals of the liturgy? So uh, oftentimes, liturgists call this historicizing, um, but it's a, it's a new it's a new shift in Constantinople. And many scholars point to the origins of this shift to a, a large influx of refugees of Greek-speaking Christians from Palestine and from Syria, from the Holy Land. So in the Holy Land, you have this indigenous piety uh, centered on the holy sites, centered on historia, centered on salvation history that took place in those sites. And during the Persian Wars that, that preceded the Islamic conquest, and, and I, I, I should note, that, you know, uh, to put it somewhat crassly, in terms of, you know, the body count, the Persian Wars were much more devastating to uh, Byzantine Palestine than the Islamic conquest at first was. So most, most scholars look at the, the trauma of the fall of, of uh, the city of Jerusalem. It really happened um, years before, before the Muslims came in. Um, so, during these Persian Wars, you had massive immigration into Constantinople, uh, sort of a retreat of Greek-speaking Christianity, and they brought with them uh, both uh, the, the monastic style of, of Palestinian Christianity and the liturgical piety. And this had a dramatic effect on the, the piety of, of, of the capital. You have things like, you know, an influx of relics, uh, and with the relics, all the hymnography of the holy places, and a real a, a real focus on materiality and salvation history, which was kind of rubbing up against an, an older piety of of almost a Neoplatonic uh, sort of approach to to the faith and to and to what the liturgy is. The liturgy oftentimes was viewed as sort of the ascent of the noose into, you know, uh, to be absorbed into the eternity of the one and, 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 concept like, and concepts like that. And you have all of these monks uh, bringing their icons and relics and their devotions to the, to the soil of, of the Holy Land. This was, very, this was very different, and it does start to shift Byzantine piety.
another example of where we see a shift in how people are understanding liturgy and also understanding art is in the the decrees of the Quintessex Council. So in ecumenical councils, oftentimes they're called to address a major um, trauma to the life of the church, a major heresy. Um, but they also do a lot of, of practical work. They issue canons. They establish canon law and normative practices and, um, you know, juridical procedures and, and all sorts of things. Um, but for a few ecumenical councils before that, uh, they had really not done any kind of local or juridical business. They focused uh, almost exclusively on the doctrinal issues. So there was a council called in Trullo, in the Palace of Trullo, um, that we now call the Quintessex Council, that was purely juridical. It just settled issues of canon law that the previous ecumenical councils had um, just failed to address. So in the Eastern tradition, that is part of our uh, conciliar tradition, that's part of our canon law. In the West, it, it wasn't quite as received as fully. And one of the reasons it wasn't received is because in these, these uh, canons of this council, we do see again, shifts that are taking place in liturgy and piety. And one of the notable canons is that from henceforth in the Byzantine tradition, the iconographic tradition, iconographic depictions were preferred over and against that older symbolic repertoire. So the council explicitly forbids things like, uh, you know, Christ being depicted as a lamb. And the reasoning that the council gives is that these are types, these are symbols, and Christ is the reality. Uh, we don't abolish the symbol, but we, we recognize it as being fulfilled. So there is a preference for, for icon over symbol. So all of these shifts were really running afoul with the traditional uh, Neoplatonic intelligentsia. And, and some uh, scholars even look at the, the controversy over icons, you know, it looks so random uh, to us, but it's really not. So if you look at the entire arc of controversy in the early church, a lot of what it's about, and, and primarily what it's about, is dealing with the tensions that come about when we're integrating Christian revelation, Christian truth, and the, the Neoplatonic uh, Hellenic philosophical tradition. So, you know, uh, for example, in our, in our age, we have a very hard time of seeing or convincing others that Jesus Christ is God. Um, in the ancient world, they actually had the exact opposite problem. They had a problem of convincing people that God could be Jesus Christ that God would enter into time and enter into matter. Uh, if you recall St. Paul when he was preaching uh, in Athens at, at Mars Hill at the Areopagus, uh, people were going along with what he was saying until he started talking about the resurrection. Um, because why, why would you want crass matter to be resurrected? This goes back to a, a really a fundamental tension that's baked in or built in uh, into Greek philosophy itself. And it really goes back right to the inception. So you have philosophers like Heraclitus and the atomists. So Heraclitus is saying everything is flux, everything is change, uh, there is no possibility of actually knowing truth. Uh, maybe Heraclitus, we don't have much of his work, so he wasn't as radical, but other philosophers were um, drawing that inference from Heraclitus. And then you have the atomists saying, you know, all is... Uh, atoms in the void, there's nothing beyond matter. Um, and that was a major uh, stumbling block to, to how do we know anything at all? How do we come to truth? If everything's changing, everything's relative, everything's flux, um, how, do we, how do we have a stable epistemology? And uh, Plato, uh, or Socrates, which we, don't, we can't really tell what is Plato and what is Socrates, uh, because Socrates comes to us via the writings of Plato. But Plato came up with his own particular solution of locating truth outside of changeable reality, outside of matter, and outside of time. Now, Plato wasn't a radical dualist, but later Platonic philosophers certainly were. So when we get to Neoplatonism, which is the main influence of uh, upon early Christian thought, we have this this baked-in or built-in 
prejudice towards locating truth within time and materiality. And a lot of the, the, the theological controversies that the church is dealing with come out of this baked-in um, tension. And the, the final, well, maybe not the final, it, it pops up, you know, uh, periodically throughout the life of the church. But we can look at the whole arc of Christian controversy in the early church and the ecumenical councils and see this dispute about icons is really part of that entire interior dispute that had been going on for centuries, um, this new shift towards history, you know, historical reality, this new shift towards matter, this new shift towards God working in and through matter, this this Christian materialism, as um, as the scholar Jaroslav Pelikan called it, uh, is really running afoul of this Neoplatonic, very sophisticated intellectualism that is that has always been popular and was popular at the time in the capital. So that's another profound tension that feeds in into the iconoclasm. So uh, uh, when you actually read what the iconoclasts said or taught or, or their grievances uh, about the icons, it was, you know, this is lowbrow piety. This is unsophisticated Christianity. This is a bunch of uneducated, dirty monks, <laughs> uh, which was how monks were seen. We hold monastics in high regard, but that's really... Um, a later development. Your average, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, Byzantine didn't hold monks at this point in high regard. So uh, they saw this as this foreign, this crass, this low-brow piety with no deeper theology that was sort of defacing their highly sophisticated um, intellectual culture. And we see this tension even play out in who supported whom in the controversy. So uh, according to most scholars, and I, I believe this is correct, uh, as far as the imperial church, as far as the, the clergy of Constantinople, um, the only bishop really who stood up against them was the patriarch, was, was Patriarch Germanos, who was um, supporting this new piety. Everyone else, every bishop, every deacon, Every priest, uh, almost to a man, sided with the iconoclasts. And almost to a man, all of the monastics sided with the, the iconophiles, the people who were defending icons. Uh, also, the great champions of the icons were not, uh, well, with some exceptions, were not the great scholars and theologians of the church. They were the lay people. So a lot of the defenders of icons were, were pious old ladies and monks. Uh, so there was this this tension, it, this internal tension that really explodes in the iconoclasm. Another source of iconoclasm it is also related to Islam, but indirectly. So where did the iconoclasts get their theology? Because iconoclasm is a Christian heresy. It's it's not it, it, it it's different than than Islam. During the proceedings of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, they they actually had eyewitness testimony to figure out where this this doctrine did come from. Was it just an invention of the emperor in the imperial court? And they concluded that that's not that's not quite the case. There were Christians advocating for iconoclasm, but it was directly rooted in their experience of of the Islamic invasion. So basically, what happened was the Muslims took over former Byzantine um, territories. But we have to remember that not all Christians in Rome, in, in the Roman Empire, were following the, the usage of, of Constantinople and the theology of Constantinople. Um, there were Coptic Christians, there were Syriac Christians, there were what, uh, what were being charged as Nestorians or Monophysites. There uh, there. The plurality of the apostolic faith was was very much part of of Roman Christianity, and of course there was the Latin the Latin Church, which had its own uh, diverse usages and, and theological traditions. So, in the East, there was this constant uh, attempt to get all Christians to be on the same page. And if you wouldn't go along, if you wouldn't become uh, an imperial Christian, uh, later uh, in the Middle East that would be known as a Melkite, as a, as a, a member of the state or imperial church, um, you were excluded really from political power. Uh, so 
There were lots of Christian groups and groups related to Christianity, particularly Jews, in, in a lot of these territories. And when the Muslims came in and replaced the Byzantine authority, these groups saw this as their opportunity uh, for regress, for, for redressing their uh, political marginalization. So what they would do, and we actually have the testimony of this in, in the, uh, the historical record, is they would go to the Muslims. They, they didn't really try to understand the, the Muslim uh, theology against image making. So it doesn't really directly influence. But what they would say is, you know, you, you guys are very pious. You don't allow images because it's clearly idolatry. Uh, neither do we. It's those, those nasty imperial Christians. It's those n nasty Melkites who do that. And they would use this issue um, to basically be put in charge. We have to remember that when the Muslims invaded, it was uh, very much unlike the Germanic invasions of the Western Empire, where you know the Gothic tribes were fleeing other invading tribes, and they weren't coming necessarily with armies, they were coming with armies and their families to permanently resettle. The Muslim conquest was, was quite different. It was a small group of military elite from Arabia who were converting people along the way and replacing the upper crest of the society, but they would leave everything else in place. So they left the Byzantine and Persian, uh, well, less so with the Persian, um, but at first they left the Byzantine administration all in place. The official language of the government was still Greek, and it was mostly Christians who were running these, these newly, um, these new caliphates, and we'll get to that more when we get to Saint uh, Saint John of Damascus, because that certainly uh, was his situation as well. So, buddying up to the Muslims or, or presenting your form of Christianity or Judaism or, or 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 what have you as more in keeping with Muslim sensibilities was a way to to be the one left in charge. So a lot of the basic ideas of iconoclasm do come from Syria, do come from Armenia, uh, do come from these these places with large populations of Christians who are not uh, imperial Christians, who are not Melkite. Um, and we believe that they're the ones who first crystallized that doctrine. So what we really have is a is a perfect storm. It's it's a all these fault lines within Byzantine society all coming to the head and blowing up over this one this one issue. Really, the icons become this catalyst where you have tensions between Orthodox and Monophysite Nestorians. You have tensions between this new uh, uh, Palestinian piety and an older sensibility that's more attached to Neoplatonism. And you have the, the military uh, collapse of the empire in the wake of, of, of Islamic aggression. And all of those seem to centralize on this one issue. Why are we devoting so much time and cultural energy to something that many see as theologically suspect, if not if not heretical, if not idolatrous. So all of these tensions blow up into this, this iconoclastic um, controversy. So it doesn't come out of nowhere, uh, it, which is you know, often how we, e even in the historical literature, it, it sort of is presented that way, but it, it, that's really not the situation on the ground. There's a lot that's building up to it. And finally, the last influence of iconoclasm, as is orthodox, we have to be, you know, um, honest and admit that there were real abuses that were going on with icons. There was a lot of erroneous custom that had built around them. And, and those, uh, you know, the iconoclasts would draw these out as reasons why this practice needs to be needs to be censured. And one of those practices is, you know, icons would stand in for godparents. Let's say you wanted a, a, a you know, a really pious godparent and no one you knew was very pious. Uh, well, why not have an icon? Doesn't that make them present? You know, why don't we have a saint be, you know, little Bobby or little Susie's godmother or godfather? So that was actually happening. Uh, another practice had to do with more folk magic. Uh, and, and some of these practices never went away, even though they were uh, uh, officially forbidden by the church. But, uh, you know, people would scrape little 
portions of the paint of an icon and use it at, you know, as a magic healing remedy. Uh, there was also abuses in the cult of, of relics. Uh, people would drink out of the skulls of martyrs uh, to help with fertility. Uh, and, and, and we actually have documentation that these things persisted, you know, uh, for centuries. Um, so it was the, the possibility of abuse and the real, the real abuses that were taking place with icons with relics that, in the minds of the iconoclasts, justified the church, um, you know, coming down and and abandoning this this whole this whole tradition. So those are are the factors that are leading to the decree of of the emperor Leo. Uh, it wasn't random. It was an attempt to reform the empire uh, on on a spiritual level, on a cultural level, before it was too. Too late, really.